Endonucleases are enzymes that cleave a DNA internal to its sequence. Because they operate on the internal sequence of a DNA, they operate equally on linear and circular DNAs. This class includes restriction endonucleases, homing endonucleases, DNases, and RNases. Restriction endonucleases are classified into four types. Type 1 endonucleases are typified by the RMS systems that are present in post-prokaryotic genomes. In E. coli, they are named HSD, R, M, and S. These endonucleases play the native immunological role of preventing infection with foreign DNAs. They undoubtedly recognize some molecular pattern, but this pattern is poorly defined and cannot be reduced to a simple sequence like the other classes we'll see. These enzymes are not used in any of the in vitro DNA manipulation protocols, but they are relevant because knocking them out is necessary for efficient transformation of E. coli. Type 2 endonucleases are the ones you're most likely familiar with. This class includes ECHOR1 and other sequence-specific endonucleases. We'll go through this class in more detail next. Type 3 endonucleases are sequence-specific, but they are not in common use for in vitro DNA manipulations. Type 4 are similar to type 1 in the sense that they are most relevant as common low-specificity enzymes present in prokaryotic genomes. They cleave methylated or otherwise modified DNAs and are typically encoded by three proteins. In E. coli, the MCRA, MCRBC, and MRR genes are an endogenous type 4 system typically knocked out to achieve. The type 2 endonucleases vary in terms of the overhangs they generate and the sequences they recognize. They are defined by being sequence-specific enzymes. There are many enzymes that generate 5' prime, 4' base pair overhangs, including BAMH1, XBA1, and ECHOR1. There are also commonly used enzymes that generate 3', prime, 4' base pair overhangs. There are also many that generate 2' base pair overhangs, either as 3' prime or 5' prime extensions. Some type 2s generate blunt ends, while there are a number of examples of type 2s that generate 5' base pair, 3' base pair, or even 1' base pair sticky ends. All the enzymes I have mentioned cleave a specific DNA sequence internal to it. Often these enzymes are palindromic, meaning that the reverse complement of the recognized sequence is the same as the original sequence. However, there are also non-palindromic cutters. Additionally, there are enzymes that recognize degenerate sequences. For example, the ALWN1 enzyme recognizes the sequence CAG, NNN, CTG. The first and last portions of that sequence are palindromic, but the internal ends can be any sequence, and thus the sticky ends generated by this enzyme can be any sequence. Type 2S enzymes recognize a specific sequence, but then cleave the DNA external to it. BSA1 and BSMB1 are the most commonly used enzymes in this class. BSA1 recognizes the sequence GGT-CTC, it reaches over one base, and then generates a sticky end composed of the next four bases. The products of BSA1 digestion can be joined by ligation to the overhangs generated from four base pair overhang generated sites such as BAMH1 and ECHOR1. These enzymes are particularly useful because the restriction site can be removed during the course of digestion. In the example shown here, the 5' prime end of the DNA containing the GGT-CTC sequence is removed from the larger DNA, leaving no trace of the original sequence. Thus, upon ligation, there is no remnant of the restriction site, and this can be used to generate scarless junctions between two DNAs. Type 2G endonucleases are very similar to the type 2S in the sense that they can be used to generate scarless junctions. BSE1 is one of the more specific and active enzymes in this class. It recognizes the sequence GAG, GAG, reaches over eight base pairs, and generates a two base pair sticky end. These are distinguished by the generation of two base pair or three prime overhangs that are compatible with enzymes such as PAC1. One particular property of this type is the need for S methionine for function, which is not a common requirement for DNA restriction reactions. The type 2 restriction enzymes are usually components of methylation restriction systems from various microbes. In these systems, the restriction enzyme is expressed in the cytoplasm. The genomic DNA is protected from cleavage because it is methylated at cognate sequences. 
Thus, these systems also have a partner methyl transferase. When cloning DNAs from genomic DNAs, there may be methylation at sites of common restriction enzymes. Not all restriction enzymes are equally good. There is a great deal of heterogeneity amongst these enzymes in terms of how specific they are for their recognition sequence. Additionally, some enzymes remain active in vitro longer than others. Also, some commercial products have higher specific activity than others and are sold in a more concentrated form. Under non-standard reaction conditions, some restriction enzymes are capable of cleaving sequences which are similar but not identical to their defined recognition sequence. This altered specificity is called star activity, and it's usually a bad thing. Star activity, or loss of functionality due to denaturation, can happen in vitro due to the presence of solvents and contaminants. These toxicants to the reaction can result in incomplete cutting. Also, some restriction enzymes are more prone to incomplete cutting than others. There is also heterogeneity about the tolerance of the enzyme for cleaving near the ends of a DNA. There's a nice table at this URL that goes through the knowledge about what enzymes do what. Some enzymes require that the DNA be supercoiled. The genomic and plasma DNAs are twisted up like a rubber band in the cell, and some enzymes will only operate on DNAs in this state. Additionally, some require that there be two different sites of the same DNA molecule because they operate as a dimer. Different restriction enzymes prefer different buffers, but many, if not most, work in PCR buffer. There can be total loss of function in putting an enzyme into a different buffer, and additionally, use of the wrong buffer can result in star activity. All these subtle properties have been characterized by the New England Biolabs, and you can look this information up at their catalog at www.neb.com. Though the sequences that are recognized vary, and the chemical aspects of the purified protein similarly vary, the chemistry that a restriction endonuclease performs is always the same. They always generate 3' hydroxyls and 5' phosphate ends. Let's take a look at this in more detail. Here we've zoomed in on a DNA sequence GA. The ribose backbone is in red. We see a single phosphate of the backbone here, and there are bonds on either end of the phosphate that connect it to a ribose. This topmost bond is attached to the 3' hydroxyl of a ribose, while this lower bond connects the phosphate to the 5' hydroxyl of a ribose. When a restriction enzyme cuts a DNA, it is the one connected to the 3' hydroxyl in green that is broken. Homing endonucleases are restriction enzymes that cleave a very long and specific recognition sequence. For example, ISE1 recognizes this 30 base pair sequence. They come from site-specific recombination systems, often from mitochondria. They don't have cognate methyl transferases. Most of them cleave at a specific site internal to the recognition sequence. Often these enzymes are so specific that they cleave uniquely once within a genome. These enzymes are not extensively used in vitro, but they've been actively pursued for DNA manipulations in vivo. They can be used to create unique double-strand breaks in the genome that stimulate DNA repair and recombination. There are other types of endonucleases outside the scope of the restriction endonucleases because they have very little sequence specificity. DNAs1 is a nonspecific endonuclease. It's a very potent enzyme, and most protocols employing this enzyme use very little of it. Like the restriction enzymes, the products are 5' phosphates and 3' hydroxyls, so the products of DNA's digestion are competent for other molecular biology protocols. In most protocols, magnesium must be supplied for activity, and this will primarily nick the DNA rather than form double-strand breaks. However, using manganese instead will alter its specificity towards double-strand breaks. DNAs1 can be used to remove DNA from an RNA sample. It is a very specific uh, for DNA over RNA. It can also be used to partially degrade large DNAs into oligo-length fragments, and this is used in various procedures including DNA shuffling. There are a variety of tricks available from DNAs1. Two of the more useful ones are NIC translation and DNA footprinting, and there are articles on those in Wikipedia you can look up. There are a variety of RNases, a few of which have utility in DNA manipulations. 
RNase A is a very potent nonspecific RNA endonuclease. It is often referred to as a ribonuclease. It has no effect on DNA and is used extensively in DNA purifications for removal of RNA contamination. RNase H is present in most cells including E. coli. It degrades RNA duplex to DNA. It is used in vitro during the synthesis of cDNA after reverse transcription of an RNA. RNase P is one of the large set of common cellular enzymes. It processes RNAs that have tRNA-like secondary structure. RNase E is also common in the cell for processing and degrading mRNAs. Cleavage of specific sequences is frequently implicated in the stability of mRNAs in the cell.